What a pleasure and honor this is to be able to host a panel with two of my absolute favorite entrepreneurs that I have the pleasure of working with. Thank you so much on behalf of Index Ventures for agreeing to this panel uh, in our Creator Summit. Um, and uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Jack and Dylan uh, from 2012 and 2013, respectively, when I first met you folks. Um, and uh, wow, the world has changed. Uh, I would love to start with asking Jack a question. Um, I think that actually back in 2013, when we first met, you probably were the first person who I met who wasn't talking about makers, but was talking about creators. So I uh, would love to hear what you thought creators meant then and how that relates to how you think of creators today. That, it's a, I actually think that's a really good question. It has changed a lot over time considerably. And uh, nope, there's no uh, canonical definition. Everybody's using the word creators now and nobody really agrees what the attributes of a creator are. So we all mean different things, which is why I think we're seeing all these market sizings, you know, come out. And some people say there's 50 million creators and some people say there's 200 million creators. And I think it's because we're talking about different people broadly. But back then, what I meant, what I was seeing was uh, I, I was a creator, I am a creator. Um, and, uh, and even now I'm making 100 music videos per year and putting them online. Um, and back then I was, I was doing similar things and putting out videos on YouTube and reaching an audience. And uh, what I realized was there were a lot of people just like me. I followed them and learned from them on YouTube and they, they made amazing digital artwork, whether it was video, you know, audio, imagery, whatever it is. And they were uh, building a following doing it. And I, I knew them. Uh, and, uh, and what I realized was um, there's, this is a whole category of people um, who nobody's really building for, and they have a lot of problems. It's very hard to be an artist in the day and age of the internet. Um, and now I think, you know, eight years later, it's pretty clear what those things were that were connecting those people. And it's also the way Patreon thinks about a creator. I think it's a few key attributes. You know, the first is that the, the relationship is one to many uh, with the audience. It's not one to one. It's, it's primarily one to many relationships between a creator and their fans. Um, the second thing is that the relationship is asymmetric. Uh, it's outside of the friends and family graph. It's the follower graph. Um, and, and the interactions are sort of um, parasocial by nature. It's not real friendships. It's, it's one-to-many friendships and, and intimacy. Uh, so it really is existing in this kind of parasocial space. Um, and then I think the other key attributes is you use media as a form of communication, audio, text, video, imagery, et cetera. Uh, and then the last thing that I think when Patreon uses the term creator that we're talking about is you use the internet as the form of that communication. The internet is the channel uh, for, that, uh, for that communication. So those are the things that we mean when we talk about creators, but a lot of those things are debatable. Do you need a following to be a creator? Adobe would say, no, <laughs> they have a lot of creators who don't have followings. Um, do you need to be internet based uh, in order to be a, a creator? I think Bjork would say, no, you can uh, do concerts and, and reach your fans, uh, you know, through venues and, and live. Um, and then there's people, uh, you know, who would say you don't even need to use media to communicate. So all these sort of attributes are up for debate. Um, but that, that's how we think about it. And, and I think it's how a lot more people are starting to think about it. Cool. I mean, Dylan, when we first met, um, you know, the two key components, two of the key components that I remember that you had for your vision of Figma, you and Evan, one was to democratize the world of design and design making. And the other one was a community of designers, like the community component. So I would love to hear, you know, maybe you weren't using the term creator in that context at the time, but how do you how do you view what's happened with creators in relative terms to the original vision of Figma that you've been executing against? Yeah, well, I grew up in Sonoma County, pretty close to where Jack spent a lot of time as well. Uh, Pengrove, he was in Petaluma for a bit uh, at the early days of Patreon. 
And I got to work at O'Reilly Media and they were the ones that I think really popularized the term maker actually through Maker Magazine. Yeah. And so I, I think for me, I, I've always thought a lot about just how important it is to be able to express yourself creatively. Uh, what you call that a maker, a creative, whatever. To me, that's an act that can be done solo. There's no audience needed. Uh, you know, my wife made this bookshelf behind me. Um, you're seeing it because we're on a Zoom call, but it wasn't made to be seen. It was made for our personal enjoyment between the two of us. And I think she's creative and a maker because she made that bookshelf. Um, I think that a lot of people make things in Figma all the time that they never show anyone or, or never use. And I, I have respect for them as well. Um, I think that, you know, I think it's, we can argue about the term creator. I think it's harder to argue about who the participants are in the creative economy. Um, and I think those are people that, like Jack said, are the ones that are putting content out there, building audience, uh, and really connecting with their, their fans online. Um, and it's really exciting to me just to see the evolution of the space and, and how much is happening. Jack, I actually, well, I was just going to say, Dylan, I think that's actually a really great point is that the term creator economy um, is precedented on value creation, yeah. which in some sense, it like assumes consumption and assumes yeah. audience. And so in order for there to be an economy around something, there must be <laughs> consumption, you know? Um, and so maybe, maybe I actually agree with you. I like, I like the separation that creator everybody can be a creator and it doesn't have to, you know, your creations don't have to be intended for an audience, but when it comes to the creator economy, now we're talking about people who are in value generation mode and looking for value capture on top of that. That's right. Yeah. I mean, of course, depending on what the cost of the particular item or the size of the community, it can, you know, you can, I mean, you can have many followers, sorry. Well, I think that's the really interesting part is like, I think part of the job of someone that's in the creator economy is to grow that community. And so it's like so much a community management job, as well as a job of like, you know, literally being an artist or a builder. Um, and those worlds conflate so much. Like, look at Jack, right? He, even before Patreon, he built this amazing community around, uh, around his music and his YouTube channel. And I think that when you see the, the people that are most successful in the creator economy, it is so, so community-based as well. Yeah. Danny, I was going to just ask you the same question because arguably you saw this before any of us and before most VCs who are now shouting craters from the rooftops, you were in SoundCloud, you were in Etsy, you were seeing a whole different economy of creators before this first wave of, of creator economy, uh, uh, capital C, capital E. Yes. Not only did you back Jack seat around like without blinking an eye, you backed ours. Uh, I remember I walked in and I had no idea like exactly all the pieces fit together. And you're like, Dylan, this is going to be huge. And I'm like, we haven't figured out what we're doing yet exactly. And then you said he got it. Like he saw 10 years out, like what it was going to be. <laughs> oh, that's, that's very kind of you folks. Um, and uh, no, I mean, the, the aspect that I saw was that... Um, all of the niches when exposed on the internet are absolutely enormous. And so, you know, while before the internet, it was very difficult to find affinity groups that were going to expand with the internet, all of a sudden that audience found their, their kin and were so excited about being able to connect and to support it. And I, I remember that one aspect that blew me away in the early days of Etsy is that 30% of the makers were actually buying things on Etsy. So, you know, that self-fulfilling, um, self-desire to support this new social class was, was, was pretty evident. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm so excited to hear about it. I will make a little point that I that I'd like to connect. Um, Jack, you've talked about the second renaissance uh, that we're in, and I remember 
talking to Dylan about his sale of crypto of the crypto punk that he sold and he was trying to convince me that it was this, that it was his Mona Lisa so there's again this connection that uh, that we that we have to the Renaissance but I wanted in a joking aside I would love to talk about how and and maybe we can start uh, with you Dylan how you feel like NFTs and crypto native components are part of this creator class and how you're thinking about enabling that with Figma. Yeah, well, let's zoom out. I mean, like, I think what's important to both Jack and I is getting creators paid. Uh, and why is that important? Well, for Figma, our mission is to make design accessible to all. We're trying to make it so that more people are able to access design and creativity. One way you can do that is to make it so that you've got great tools. They're really easy to use. Uh, they're not intimidating to people um, and they're easy to access across all platforms, et cetera. Another way to do that is to make sure that creators actually have the economic means they need to go make more content and to go pursue their dreams and their art forms. And I think NFTs are truly exciting because they start to enable that for some people, just like Patreon enables it. And um, I think that we're seeing so many different ways that people are now using NFTs to monetize uh, this work. And I think also there's something really special on Ethereum right now in particular, where Ethereum um, uh, is, I think, so experimental and it really has this sort of, um, this almost uh, meme economy uh, where, and crypto in general has this, it's where you're really looking at, okay, whether it's Dogecoin or, uh, it's things like, you know, we're seeing this outside of crypto with things like GameStop, right? You can dismiss these as fads and go, oh, whatever, like people are being irrational with their money and their gambling. Or you can say, wait a second, like people are trading on memetic ideas. Um, and I think that if you think about it, that's maybe actually has some uh, currency in the art uh, ecosystem as well, which you're more of an expert on than I am, Danny. But um, I, I think that you're really betting on, okay, what ideas are going to take off and which ideas will end up spawning new classes of behavior uh, and become canon and become canonical. And uh, that combined with, okay, how do I actually feel more relationship with the creator, right? So if I believe that this creator is going to be really important in the history of humanity, uh, how do I basically make it so that I'm able to easily build that relationship, be in their community, um, and prove my, my fandom through an NFT, uh, which might let me get more into perhaps a private discord with the creator or a private discord with, you know, all the people that are the other top, top fans. Uh, these concepts start to merge together in a really interesting way very quickly. I completely agree, Dylan. I, the, uh, the exciting thing I think about NFTs broadly, I think there's two, two exciting things. One, you know, artists have been, uh, the term creator economy is not, it's not like this is the first time art and money have intersected. This is one creator economy. There have been many more before this. So, um, you know, that's a, that's an important thing to put in perspective for, for many, many years, you know, the, the main form of, of creator monetization was around, you know, physical good sales with, with your art on it, whether it's a CD or a DVD or whatever it is, there is a whole, you know, supply chain, lots of infrastructure around selling physical goods with your art on them. Um, then the internet came around and you have a lack of scarcity. You have infinite replicability. You have instantaneous connection. Physical good sales don't work in that world. <laughs> you know, the music industry tanked. Um, unit sales as, as, a, as a, um, you know, a, a, a line on a creator's p &L evaporated. So what is the creator economy that works with the internet? That is what we're talking about right now when we use the term creator economy is, okay, what are going to be the new business models that appear in creators' businesses um, to generate revenue for, for the global production of, of arts? And I think the exciting thing about right now is that's largely unimagined territory. There are some good bets being placed and some, some exciting innovations happening. NFTs are one of those things, I think, uh, that, that are, are really wonderful about it. And the thing that I think is particularly exciting about NFTs is it's a new form of value capture um, where previously every interaction on the internet is essentially monetized via engagement converting to ad revenue. And then the value capture happens 
uh, in an advertiser and in the market cap of the company that is uh, distributing the content. Um, so all of the energy of the web, all of the value creation is being captured essentially in Facebook and Google. Um, but what's exciting about NFTs is that value capture gets transferred to consumers and creators. So all that energy and sharing and enthusiasm and excitement and resale and all those things that are happening anyway, now the value generated by those activities is going to creative people and going to the people who are enjoying the creativity. That is a new exciting phase of the web. Yeah, and I'll just add one more thing, which is I think that the other macro trend here that's really important to understand and it, it cannot be overstated is the shift that we're seeing across the world from the past few decades. I mean, this is not a new trend from physical to digital and from people living their lives in a physical space to a digital space. And you know, you can see the early signs of this and people creating Facebook profiles and the engagement they had on Facebook and YouTube uh, and other social networks. But now I think with celebrated by the pandemic, we're seeing more people just literally live online. If you live online, you actually do desire goods online too. Uh, I think that some people think that NFTs and uh, all this world is just speculation. I'm not going to lie. There's a lot of speculation. Um, that's a huge part of it, but I don't think it's the entire part of it. Uh, having find, found my corner of the internet where you know people are really looking to collect and hold forever on some of these assets, um, I think there's a real appreciation of the creativity of some of the art and I think it's also a really important part because it's like you are living, it's almost like you're, you're building a museum with people in the case of a DAO, for example, where then you can go in and enjoy that art. And for some reason it's different if you are enjoying the art that someone else owns versus the art that your community owns. And so th this is an awesome discussion. And um, I was just trying to think about Jack, from the, from the creators that you have on the platform today, how, fluent do you think they are about this trend and understand the tools that are at their disposal for their creativity? And how much is that part of the responsibility or the opportunity that Patreon has to bring them to this next level of the evolution of the internet? I mean, of course, it's a distribution, right? There's a portion of creators who are incredibly savvy and business-minded and um, architect types, you know, and they, they are their own CFO and their own CEO and they're their own innovation lab and they're discovering new products that they can use to help them run their businesses. That's a whole uh, profile of creator that we study and try to support and try to help. And there's a lot of creators um, who are not like that. There's a lot of creators who want to play guitar and sing and, and would have it be and just would prefer everything to kind of um, be easy and kind of work with that, you know, with that system. So, um, you know, it's 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 a broad distribution. I'd say it's the really kind of um, uh, forward thinking folks who are, you know, doing NFTs and setting up new businesses and trying hundreds of new products. It's a relatively small portion, but they're there and they're incredibly savvy and smart. And it's one of my favorite things I think about creators in general is um, there is a tendency, I think when people use the term creator, you know, the, the archetype of, a, of an artist now in 2021, so different than the archetype of an artist creator in 1970, yeah. right? Like if 1970 selected for Jimi Hendrix, you know, um, can you imagine Jimi Hendrix on a webcast? Uh, hey guys, don't forget to like and leave a comment below. Um, you know, like that's just, it's a different type of person. The nerds have come out of the closet. Uh, the, the intellectual, analytical, creative people who wrote songs on ukulele are all over the web now and they're smart as hell and they're making stuff and building businesses. And so it's a, yeah, I would say, Danny, it's a, it's a new type of creator. And there's a lot of folks who, who are in that uh, very analytical, forward thinking mindset. And so Dylan, um, I've got to ask about, you know, how you envision the users of Figma today versus when you were kicking off Figma and how much of this community of creators that we're talking about, do you, do you envision using Figma as a tool of creativity for them? Yeah, I mean, I see, um, I, I think Figma is a general purpose tool 
that people, I know people use it for NFT work and they use it for, uh, for work in sort of this, this creative economy, but there's a lot that we don't do, right? We don't do video. Uh, you know, people will make 3D art in Figma, but probably not the place that you want to do it first. Uh, you know, so I think that it's, um, I, I wouldn't say that we have like, here's our NFT strategy or something at Figma right now. We're really focused on just making sure that we complete that life cycle from like, you have an idea and you can brainstorm and ideate with your team to design to production. Um, but I think if we can do that right, then we can make it so that there's more digital experiences that are possible uh, in a variety of contexts, whether that's on the internet, uh, on mobile phones, or the future in the metaverse, 3D, you know, AR, VR. Um, you know, really, that's our goal is to own that life cycle wherever it exists. And so, folks, as we're talking about this, you both have independently talked to me about this Gen Z generation, where 75% of them want to be creators rather than consumers. So have we thought about like what happens if the world becomes all these creators and what happens to who consumes all this stuff? Like, you know, what, what, what happens to this new economy that actually comes to bear where most people don't want to join others, they want to nece necessarily or work for something else or consume, they want to create. First of all, I think this is fucking awesome because the, um, I, I mean, look, like let's compare this to 10, 15 years ago, right? How many people were raising their hands saying, I want to be a creator? No one. <laughs> um, you know, there was a popular perception that like, you know, if you wanted to well, do maybe art, Jack, but, but few people. <laughs> Jack, I mean, there's a few people. I, I mean, there's yeah. people on YouTube, but I think even them were doing it because it was pure, pure passion. It was, I think, Maybe maybe 15 years ago. I mean, it depends on yeah. how far back you go, but it's some. I don't know, Dylan. I, I was doing it for the money. I mean, <laughs> let me let me tell you, it was that that's where it was at back in 2013. <laughs> how much money were you making on 2013 off YouTube? $166 a month of ad revenue. There you but go. we did get some good brand deals. <laughs> that's true. So I think it was mostly about the passion at that point. Yes. And I think um, you know, now that's changed. Uh it's actually a viable career path. And all the kids who, you know, told their kids, told their parents when they wanted to grow up, oh yeah, I want to be an artist or I want to make things. And the parents are like, that's nice. How about something else? <laughs> I want to make sure that you can eat. Um, you know, it's, it, it's just like a different world today. Um, yeah. And I think it's wonderful that we've kind of made that bit flip from consumption to creation or that's coming at least. I think that, you know, outside of Gen Z, I don't think we made the bit flip yet, actually. Uh, I think everyone else is just getting used to it. Um, and so I, I'm ecstatic. I think that the market will figure it out in terms of how many uh, jobs we can support here. And I think that also, by the way, it's totally unclear what the what the um, uh, role of AI will play here. Um, not to throw in another buzzword, but yeah, yeah. I think that um, no one really knows how fast uh, AI will develop and the role of that in creating content uh, for people. And I am so excited for a world where humans are creating content and expressing themselves, maybe with AI help, uh, I get a little bit more worried if if we're all just like, let's see that TikTok uh, is is just uh, gonna be like an AI bot and create deep fakes all day that are maximally tuned to uh, make our dopamine receptors go off. Like that, that gets a little bit freaky. <laughs> Jack, any thoughts? I, I mean, mean I thoughts, but please. Yeah, it's it's a very exciting time in history. I I, I think um, you know what the internet has afforded us is the is the ability to reach people with the things that we make and say, and um, that is a very very exciting time for humans as a species. Uh, you know, I think you you named it, Danny. You said it's the it's the niche, but you know, really what what that is is. You know, if I'm if I'm a weirdo, if I make really strange art, let's say nobody in my town likes my stuff. One in a thousand people. I play a show. Two people show up. It's like weird art. Well, there's two billion people online, more three billion people. Uh, so there's there's three million people on the Web who would like my stuff, even if I'm a real weirdo and I got a one in a thousand batting average. You know, we're talking about hundreds of millions of people 
who can make things and reach millions of people and build a legitimate audience and business around just the idea of creation. That has never been possible in the history of humanity. And it's possible right now. It's happening right now. Yeah. That makes this a very unique time for us. I think it's a, a, a Dylan, if we're going with buzzwords, um, I'll throw out future of work. Like clearly this is, this is, a, um, this is a new category of, of member of the workforce and of value creation. I was talking, um, uh, yeah, I was talking to a company just yesterday um, who's, who's specifically helping people build 3D galleries in which they can explore NFTs. Um, you know, uh, in this world where, you know, the, the, the metaverse and the internet, it, you know, is, is eating human interaction, um, pretty much everything we make now could have an audience and becomes one to many. And it then makes us creators with a following. Um, and so I think we're gonna see a lot more of, of people making things and, and building um, fan bases, audiences, communities, et cetera. And, and, uh, and pretty much, you know, everything we do is, is becoming creation. So yeah, I, I just, I know I'm an internal optimist, but I do think this is just such an exciting time for, for humanity. And uh, one last question that I wanted to ask is, you know, uh, Dylan, you mentioned how, how the proximity of where you grew up to where Jack spent a lot of time and you're both uh, building companies out of San Francisco um, and we're talking about some really important future global trends. Truly, how global do you think this is? Um, completely, completely global. Um, yeah. I, I think the uh, whatever mindset was present in the Bay Area uh, that differentiated that as a geographic region um, for, for some time, you know, it now lives, that mindset now lives in the internet. And regardless of where you grew up physically, uh, you can tap into it if you so choose. And there'll be more and more content created that makes it so that you're able to tap more into that zeitgeist. Already we have Twitter, but I think that there'll be just, that's gonna even explode further. Uh, we're gonna see hubs and uh, people starting amazing companies and people creating amazing work everywhere in the world that we're already seeing that. It's going to, you know, whatever dial that you have that's on a scale of one to 10, if we're at a two right now, it's going to be a 20 tomorrow, not tomorrow, but in, in a few years, you know, it's, it's a very exciting time for people living anywhere in the world. And I think it's also wonderful to see people anywhere having this opportunity uh, to be able to make money because that's a way to, um, to really just help uh, make their lives easier as well. And Jack, I saw you nodding around, nodding a lot. Um, so I'm going to take advantage of the fact that you're happy with Dylan's answer to ask you a final question because I'm we're squeezed on time. Sorry, Dylan, I'm I'm like migrating. It was a great answer, but I want to make so the the one, one last question that I had, Jack, for you I, is I like I like that Jackie just got set up for implicit agreement. It's perfect. Yeah, I saw it. I saw him nodding. He was totally on board with it. So I'm taking advantage of that. Um, Jack, you know. Andy Warhol uh, famously said that everyone has 15 minutes of fame. So my question is, in light of what we're talking about, like the fact that this is a global phenomenon, the fact that niches are being uh, niches are being are being uh, appreciated. Do you think that we're going to have the same uh, magnitude of celebrities and stars and uh, creators that get to global appreciation in the way that we have in the past? I mean, do you think that, you, you know, there there will be uh, Katy Perry's and Leonardo da Vinci's in the future, or are we gonna go very nichified? I think we will. I, I think we will still have global phenomena. Um, nothing's gonna stop stranger things. Uh, there will be things that resonate with everyone. Um, the difference is that, man, I hate the word long tail. I, I, I don't like thinking about it like that. But the difference is, yes, the peaks will be just as big at the top. Yeah. There's a power law that's kind of unavoidable on the internet and, and just with general you know, uh, uh, dynamics of a marketplace. Um, 
The difference is the long tail will be much taller and much fatter and wider. And lots of people will be able to reach millions, which that's the part that didn't used to be able to exist. So I don't really think it, it changes the contour of the distribution, if that makes sense. It yeah. just, it makes the, um, it makes it more possible for anyone to engage and to participate. That is the like democratizing part of it that I think is really special and, and unique um, to this world of connection that we live in right now. Well, folks, I'm respectful of your time because you're very busy and the opportunity cost of spending more time with us versus going back to work on your businesses doesn't make sense. So thank you so much for this uh, for this discussion uh, really it was it was super insightful and it's fun to, to have you both even virtually in the same room. Thanks for having us and Jack, Danny, it's great to see you. Thank you, Danny. Really appreciate it. Ciao, see folks. You.